Good morning. Welcome to Grace Free Lutheran Church. Uh, good to have you here. Special word of welcome to those of you who are, who are visiting. My sister Lene and her husband Gary are here visiting with us this weekend and, and worshiping with us too. It's good to have you. Gary's always been my favorite brother-in-law. With a name like that, how could you not love him? Come on, that was funnier than that. <laughs> I worked hard this morning. <laughs> Morgan, where are you at? Come and give us an announcement. Take me off the hot seat. <laughs> Good morning. All right. Ignite Youth will be having an in information night on September 4th at the Free Lutheran Bible College at 6 p.m. We are inviting parents, students, and anyone who is interested in learning about our youth ministry. Um, also, don't forget, Sunday school registrations are due by September 1st. If you are interested in being a part of either of these ministries, please let me know. <laughs> Uh, lastly, please pray for both Sunday School and Ignite Youth. Thank you. And as far as other announcements, a reminder of the congregational meeting following the service this morning. Got a couple of items of business to, to uh, consider, or one for sure and another one to discuss. So um, please plan to stay for that meeting if you're a member. And... Um, Wednesday evening, we'll have Bible study and, and kids club here at the church. Then youth will be at Bassett Creek Park in Crystal from 6 to 8. Uh, you see the youth night planned in, uh, at uh, Emmaus Free Lutheran Church in Bloomington on Friday the 30th of August. And then next Sunday morning, we are here uh, worshiping at 9.30. And uh, next Sunday will be Communion Sunday. Are there any other announcements that need to be made? Okay, if not, we'll call on the praise team. Or the worship team. I, I don't, I get them wrong. <laughs> Tell you what, we'll do both this morning. We'll do praise and worship. <laughs> Good morning, church. At Grace, our mission statement is proclaiming Jesus, that all may follow him. And I hope that this morning you're here not just to take in the truth of God's word, but that as we leave from here this morning, you use it to show the love of Christ to the world around you. And we're going to be talking about that this morning with the title, Love One Another, for our message. So this morning's worship uh, music focuses on Love, the love that Christ has for us, the love that we share with one another. Um, our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 122, verse 1. It says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. I invite you to stand as we worship together this morning. Nothing can separate, even if I ran away, your love never fails. I know I still make mistakes, to have new mercies for me every day. Perfect. 
good to know that God's love never fails. It's new every morning. And if we take that to heart, it's with our whole hearts that we can truly sing, My Jesus, I love thee. Jesus, tis now, at this very moment, where we bow our hearts to worship our God, and as we think about what we just sung, part of our expression of love to Christ is acknowledging our sin and our need for forgiveness.
Let's bow our hearts together and confess our sin. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess to you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Therefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy and ask you for Christ's sake. Grant us forgiveness of all our sins, and by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will, and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God promises in his word, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if we confess that from our hearts, we have the knowledge that we have forgiveness of our sins. Amen. I'm going to ask that you stay standing for our scripture reading this morning. It's just a couple short passages. Uh, the first one, if you're following along, either in your Bible or in your mobile tablet, um, comes from Leviticus 18, 1 through 5. Again, Leviticus 18, 1 through 5, reading in Jesus' name. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt, where you lived. And you shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan, to which I am bringing you. You shall not walk in their statutes. You shall follow my rules and keep my statutes and walk in them, for I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules, and if a person does them, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. And then flipping over to 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 13. You've probably heard this spoken at weddings before. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the, when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. But when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child, and I reasoned like a child. And when I became a man, I gave up my childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Here ends our scripture reading, and let's join together and confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, 
the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. And I think I heard Charlotte come in and wanted to come up front to see Daddy. You want to come up front and see Daddy? Yeah? Well, that's good, because Daddy's doing the children's sermon today. So all the kids could come up front. <laughs> Hi. You can come here. All the kids can come up front. You can bring your parents with you if you want. You can bring friends with you. How's everybody doing? Good? Did you guys have a fun birthday yesterday? Yeah? We were out at the Schultheis triplets birthdays yesterday, sweating it out in the bouncy house. So we had a lot of fun. <laughs> All right. Who can tell me what this is? But what is this thing? A phone. Everybody agree? It's a phone? Actually, it's even more than a phone. Nowadays, people call it a mobile device because you can do so much more than just call people on it. What else can you do with one of these? I'm sure you guys have probably, actually, let me ask you first. Which one of you has one of these? That's good. I'm glad that nobody raised their hand. Sometimes I don't like having one of these. <laughs> what else can you do with one of these? When I was growing up, it used to be that you could just call somebody with one of these. Now what can you do with them? Yeah. You can play games. You can text people. Watch YouTube. Yep. Call people. Yep, you can still call people. How many different ways can you call people now? whole bunch. You can call them just by calling them. You can call them on FaceTime. You can call, like, all these video chat platforms. You can do that. You guys still haven't called out the thing that I was hoping somebody would say that you can do with these. Instagram. You can do Instagram. Do you do a lot of Instagram? <laughs> can you take pictures on these? Yeah. And you can take videos. How many of you guys have stolen your parents' phone and done some videos with your phone? Yeah, I know my kids like to do that sometimes. They take it around the house and they're making videos. Yeah, so you can take videos. That's something that when I was growing up, you couldn't do a video on a phone, but you can now. What do we do with those videos? I think Ginny mentioned one. Put it on Instagram. Put it on TikTok. You put it on Facebook. Oh, you can't do TikTok. Sorry. Some people do TikTok. You can do a whole bunch of things with these videos. In fact, if you go on YouTube, all of those videos were created by somebody. And a lot of them are using their mobile devices to create those videos. Some of them, yeah. We are actually, this may or may not shock you, but there are people that run a lot of numbers that say we are the most connected society in the world, meaning everybody has a phone. And we can talk to everybody. We can FaceTime with everybody. We see everything that everybody does. Now think about that. Do you guys like it when people see everything that you do? No. No. I don't like it when people see everything I do. Actually, it kind of makes me nervous to think that people could see everything that I do. Where else do you find video cameras besides your phone? On your cameras in your house? Yeah, if you, some people have cameras in their house. Where else? You know there's cameras when your parents are driving around? At like stoplights and things? Yeah, there's cameras in the back of your car. There's cameras when you check out at the grocery store. There's cameras everywhere. Did you know we have cameras in church here? 
There's a camera right back there. You guys can turn around and wave at the camera. There's a camera right there. And actually, if you go right up above that, there's another camera right above it. And if you look over here, there's another black camera over there. We put these in place so we make sure that your parents are paying attention during the church service. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But it is, when you think about it, a little bit unnerving when we think about how many cameras are watching what we do. Now, if you go away and hide in your closet in your room, can anybody see what you're doing? Are you sure about that? You have cameras in your closet? Oh, you don't? <laughs> Did you know that there's one person in the entire universe that can see you even when you lock yourself in your closet? Who's that? God. God can see what we're doing even when we think that nobody else can see what we're doing. No matter what. So I got a couple verses here. One is Hebrews 4.13. It says, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So that's God saying he can see everything in all creation. That rock that's sitting in your front yard and you can't see the underside of the rock, even God can see the underside of the rock. That's pretty cool. And then Proverbs 15.3 says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. And then I like the one in Psalm 139. Psalm 139 has a lot to say about what God can see. But it has language in it that says, Lord, you search me and you know me. You know when I sit down. You know when I rise up. You discern my thoughts. So God even knows your thoughts. You know when I lay down. And then here's the really cool part that I like about it. It says, even before a word is on my tongue, behold, you know it all. Excuse me, that wasn't, I like that part too, but this is the part that I really like. Verses 15 and 16, it says, my frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me. Then as yet, there was none of them. Do you know what that means? God saw you before you even existed. As you were being formed in your mom's belly, God saw you and knew you. Isn't that cool? And yet it's kind of scary because one of the verses we said, he sees the good and the evil. Do you guys always do good things? I look at all the cute faces, and I'd love to think that you guys all do good things all the time. But I have kids of my own, and I know that that's not true. And I know that I don't do good things all the time. So God sees the good and the evil. Do we like it when God sees the evil? I don't always like it. And that's why I need to go and ask God for forgiveness when I do bad things, because I know that he sees them. He sees the good things but he also sees the bad things that I do. And that's why I really love, this is a verse that you guys probably know. John 3, 16 and 17, it says, For God so loved the whole world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And listen to this part. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world or punish the world, but in order that we might be saved through him. So Jesus came not to necessarily punish us. There is punishment for our evil deeds. if We don't ask for forgiveness. But he came to point us to God and to save us. So next time we think we can get away with things that are sinful, remember that God is always watching. But even more importantly, when we do sin, and we're going to sin, know that God loves you and wants you to come to him, confessing your sins and renewing that relationship with him. Okay? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word this morning. We thank you um, 
In a sense, we do thank you that you do see all things, even the bad things, um, because you then, through your Holy Spirit, convict us and cause us to draw closer to your cross and ask for forgiveness, Lord. I thank you so much for these kids, Lord, and I pray that you would um, help them each and every day. Help us to listen to our parents. Help us to do good things when we're playing with our friends um, and with our siblings, Lord, so that we can honor you in our activities, Lord. And I pray that for us as, as adults, too, that as we go about our day, that the things that we do would be honoring and glorifying to you, even in those areas where we think we can hide things. Lord, in all of that, I pray that your name would be glorified. In your name I pray. Amen. All right, you guys can go back. Thanks for coming. We do. And I'm going to call upon the ushers as we worship the Lord with our tithes and offerings and also on the Flown family to share a musical offering with us this morning.
you so much, Flo and family. Before our message message this morning, let's stand together as we sing the hymn, Break Thou the Bread of Life. In John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, we have these words of Jesus recorded for us. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So how many love songs exist in the world? Anybody want to... Guess? Millions? 25 million? Okay. I didn't count them, so I'm not going to argue with you. (laughs) Then you're right. That's right. (laughs) Paul McCartney wrote the song that said, The world tells us we've had enough of silly love songs. 
And then he says, what's wrong with that? (laughs) And he promotes silly love songs. We heard a lot of songs about God's love for us or his call to us to love him, even this morning, in the prelude and in the worship uh, time when, uh, when they led us with the singing. Um, I, proportionately in the last 20 years, there may be more Christian songs about love than have been written by secular artists. I, I wouldn't doubt that. Is that right, John? You're not sure. <laughs> Love makes the world go round, though, right? And if you've ever felt unloved, been in a place where you felt unloved by a group of people or whatever, it can be lonely, that's for sure. Well, our gospel text for this morning leads or deals, excuse me, with the topic of, of love. Even Jesus was interested in the subject of love. In fact, he was more than interested in the subject. He was all about love. He was love because he is God. And he calls us to love one another. Love one another. Do you realize it's not an option for us? This is a command. Jesus says, a new command I give you. You should love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. It's not an option for us. It's something that God expects and has a right to of every believer toward every other believer. No exceptions. Ouch. (laughs) Love. It's a standard by which your Christian relationships and mine are to be measured. He says it's a new command. What does that mean, new? It's not new in terms of chronology. There's there's been calls for love and commands of love way back even into the Old Testament times. I mean, in in Leviticus uh, 19, at verse 18, we read, Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one another, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. It's not a new command in, in terms of chronology. But it is a command that needs to be issued anew in each and every generation, and in my case, several times a week, because I don't always love as I ought, and neither do you. The Jews needed the new commandment to love one another. So did the Gentiles. Nobody was better, nobody was worse. The Jews had so narrowed the scope of that command to love, so reshaped and redefined it that it was largely rendered to have no effect. And don't think that we can't do that ourselves. Whenever I want, I can find a way to justify not loving a certain individual, not dealing with them as Christ would deal with them. Because... I don't like them, or I've got a grudge against them. Even though we're told not to hold grudges, it's easy to do. Jesus is the source of this new command. and, and, And the command then is new in the sense, and it is higher in the sense that Jesus gave his life and set the perfect example of love. And I'll build on that in my second main point. Jesus, who makes all things new, showed by his example what God really means about love. Jesus' love was new and superior, faultless, intelligent. He was always interested in other people. His eyes were always looking out, not looking within. And he found opportunity after opportunity to show to individual after individual and group after group what it was to love with the love of God. 
He gave his disciples something for which to aim. But it wasn't just back in Bible times. It's today too. A new commandment Jesus is giving us this morning. To love one another. This is one of those texts where <laughs> I, I, I can... I can, I don't know, I just feel like Moses must have felt when he went up to the mountain and encountered God in the burning bush and God said to him, take off your shoes. You're standing on holy ground. And when we deal with the love of God and he deals with us in his love, I don't know that there's holier ground than that. We are to love one another with Christ's love as the source and as the example. He says, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. That little word, as, means in similar fashion, similarly to how I do it. Or just like I love you. You're to love one another. Jesus is the source of this unique and superior love. And if you want to experience God's love, you have to come to him through Jesus, don't you? Whether it's through the word or back in that day when he was there in person. And having come to him, you've experienced that unquestionably superior love. And it's given to you that you might give to others. This morning somebody told me we're blessed to be a blessing. We've been loved so that we can love. And that same love is to be applied to your brothers and sisters in the family of God. And you know what? Nothing less will do. If I love you with my love, not worth much. If I could speak with the tongues of angels, isn't that what Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians 13? But if I do it without love, I'm just a noisy cymbal. I play drums. And I like playing drums. But I don't want to just be a dumb old drum. I don't want to be just a bunch of noise. I pray that I'm not standing up in front of you this morning. Trying to sound impressive, but really just making noise. This love requires love between believers. Hebrews 13, 1 tells us, keep on loving each other as brothers. I don't always like my siblings, but I need to love them. And there are times when they've done something to me or not done something they should have and I might get mad or angry or or feel neglected or hurt. But I don't quit being their brother. And it's just so true and maybe even on a deeper level, isn't it? As we talk about loving one another in the family of God. Jesus set the example. He manifested God's love to us and he would pour it out into our own hearts. Paul calls us in Philippians chapter 2 beginning at verse 4, each of you should look out not only to your own interests but also to the interests of love. That's really what love is all about. Having eyes that are looking out, not eyes that are looking in. Not Thoughts that are consumed by self, but concern for others. He says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider that equality with God something to be grasped, the way a a little child would grasp a doll or a favorite toy, toy and not let you play with it. It's yours or it's mine. 
No, that's not what he's talking about here. That's not the way he acted. That wasn't his attitude. He didn't consider his equality with God to be something to be hung on to. Instead, it says he made himself nothing. The God of the universe made himself nothing. Took the very nature of a servant and was found to be in human likeness. He became one of us. That's God's love for us. God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What an amazing love. What a life-changing love. In 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9, Paul writes, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. That's love. And we read in Hebrews 2.11, But the, both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers, but he laid down his life for us. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. Would you do that? And I don't mean literally, physically die. Would you lay down your life and respect what they have to say? Would you lay it down by being quiet rather than arguing? Think of his willingness to accept and, even, and to save even the, even the most godless and repulsive of people. How about the sinful woman? Her name was Mary. She was a sister of Lazarus and Martha. Remember? In Luke 7, when she came into a banquet, and she came to Jesus, and as she bent down, she was weeping, and tears were falling on his feet. Was Jesus repulsed by her? Did he tell her to get lost? Uh -uh. She opened that <laughs> She opened that vial. Of, of perfume and poured it on him and wiped his feet with her hair. And Jesus commended her. He stood up for her. He loved her. Or how about Zacchaeus? I call him little big man. Tiny guy, probably shorter than 10 and 11 year old kids. Couldn't see Jesus. Then he had that great, that brilliant idea. I'll climb up in this tree. Nobody's watching. I can get up there. I can get hidden in the leaves. And after he goes by, I'll just get down when the crowd follows him down the street. But Jesus, Jesus messed it up, didn't he? He came to the tree and stood under it. And he looked up and he said, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going to your house today. You're the object of my love. I'm going to change you. Or how about the woman at the well, John chapter 4. Married five times, now living with a person. She'd given up on the idea of marriage. And yet, she... She, I think she's embarrassed by her past, and that's the reason why she comes out to get her water jugs filled in the middle of the day. Jesus met her there, and offered her living water, and her life was changed. That woman who didn't like the townspeople, now didn't care about the past, she leaves her jug there at the well and runs into town and she starts telling everybody she sees, I met a man who tells me everything I've ever done. He knows all about me. Could he be the Messiah? Come and see. He touched her with his love. 
He gave her that living water, which not only gave her life, but flowed out from her so that others could see and follow Jesus too. Do we as his disciples follow his example? Do we manifest such a love? Do we show it in a willingness to call our fellow Christians brothers and sisters and to live with them as such? Do we manifest such love by a sacrificial giving spirit? Because that's what love in its essence is all about. Giving, sacrificing, doing for someone else, seeking to improve their lives. Do we manifest such love by accepting even the less lovable? Manifest it by a willingness to serve rather than to be served? Manifest it by bearing with each other? Because none of us is perfect. Do we show a willingness to forgive? And willingness to leave it in the past when we do? Do we love by caring enough to confront and to discipline where it's needed? Do we love with the love of Jesus in patient dealings with those who doubt? Or by regular prayer for each other? I, I, I sense that there are many of you who pray for me and especially so on a Sunday morning. And I'm grateful for that. I believe God answers that prayer. You pray for each other. Listen to this. It's as important that you pray for each other as it is that you would pray for your pastor or other spiritual leaders. It's every bit as important that you pray for each other. And as you pray for each other, you know what's going to happen in answer to that prayer? <laughs> You're going to begin to feel different about the other people that you pray for. He'll work an air, an, an, an air of, of, of acceptance of others, of patience for others, of caring for others. We love because he first loved us. Our love is not in the context of trying to earn God's acceptance. It isn't legalistic in any way. It is a matter of grace. It is a matter of having experienced that love and wanting to share it with others. And in the congregation, and it's really the setting here is of believers for believers loving one another, We are to love as he loves us. Live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers. Be compassionate and humble. 1 Peter 3.8 And from the adult class manual, which we use for new membership classes, the author of that book writes, and I quote here, We should keep the law, not in order to become Christians, but because we are Christians. Not the fear of punishment, but the love of God should be the motive of our obedience. We should love one another, thirdly, so that the world will know that we are Jesus' disciples. That's the whole context of 1 Corinthians 13. Micah mentioned this morning that it's used at, at weddings an awful lot. And it really is. And there's nothing wrong with that. But do you realize that's not the immediate context of 1 Corinthians 13? That chapter is in between chapters 12 and 14. That's pretty good math, right? What, what are chapters 12 and 14 about? They're about God's gifts to us. Spiritual gifts. By which and through which he enables us to love one another. That's the motive. Not to draw attention to ourselves. Not to have people say, whoa, can he really do that? Or, boy, can she sing? Or whatever, the, whatever it is. Uh-uh. 
It's to touch others with the love of God that it might change them. I mean, think about it. The Old Testament plagues, they, they worked fear into Pharaoh's heart, but they didn't save him, right? They didn't change him. And in Revelation, the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls, they don't change people's hearts. Even the miracles of Jesus changed very few hearts. And there are, you know, like in John, where, where he raises Lazarus, and it says many of the Jews believed. Let me tell you something. Many of those same Jews, a couple weeks later, stood at the dais where Pilate was, and they said about Jesus, crucify him. We don't have any other king but Caesar. And they even dared let his blood be on us. That enough? No, 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 no. On us and on our children. Unbelievable. No cosmic disturbance, no display of nature or power will convince the world of God. But think about this. Men and women and boys and girls touched and changed by the love of Jesus who begin to show that love to others, who really begin to love and care for each other. These people convince the world of God. What was said of the early church? Look how they love the brothers. And secretly there was that desire. I want to be with them. I want to be a part of that. Only this love truly glorifies God and identifies us as his people. Love, Christ-like love, is the distinguishing mark of the Christian disciple, excuse me. And we can never substitute an inferior brand because it'll never work. Yet we don't need to practice an inferior love. We don't need to fake it because our lives have been touched and changed by that love. We're new and different people. And if we live that love, if we show that love, if that really becomes a practical standard for our daily lives, it just encourages us all the more to show that love to others. In John, 1 John 3, verse 14 through 18, we read, We know that we've passed from death to life. How? Because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. This, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay our lives down for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. Let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves with that sacrificial, godlike love, has been born of God and knows God. I'll end my message with this benediction from 1 Thessalonians 3. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. Amen. Lord Jesus, thank you for your love. A love that uh, we can spend a lifetime getting to know and experiencing. But I thank you that it's a love that we can also show to others. That you would fill our lives with it and enable our lives to be marked as yours. As we would show it to our brothers and sisters. Help us to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. May that be our prayer this morning as we close with the hymn, O Master, Let Me Walk With Thee. I invite you to stand together.
this benediction. Now as you go on your way, may God go with you. May he go before you to show you the way. May he go behind you to encourage you, beside you to befriend you, above you to watch over you, and within you to give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for coming today.